Right, so welcome everyone to this Meet the Charity Regulator event run by Scottish Ch Charity Regulator Oscar. My name is John Phelps. I'm Oscar's Senior Manager for Digital and Communications and it's my pleasure to host this afternoon's event. Purpose of today is to help inform charities, trustees and our stakeholders of our work as an enabling regulator for Scotland's 25,000 charities. So to do this, I'll shortly introduce our chair and our head of regulation improvement, give you some background in our organisation and our work before we move on to a question and answer session. Uh, we plan to finish this event at three o'clock. So for those of you that have got other plans this afternoon, we're trying to finish as sharply as we possibly can. But before we move on, uh, I will have some brief housekeeping comments for you all. So today's event is being recorded. Right. We hope to be able to publish a recording of this session on our website, our YouTube channel afterwards, so people who can't attend today can get the benefit of the, the discussions that we're about to have. If uh, And you've signed up as part of your registration, give us your permission for doing that. But remember, it is being recorded if you want to ask a question later or other things, bear that in mind. We have got, a, uh, I hope to hear from a range of voices, during the event, but I'd ask that you keep your microphone off when you're not speaking so we can we can each hear each other clearly. Now we've got a, la a large range of questions to go through, which we collected from you when you signed up for the event. Uh, but please feel free to contribute any other questions or comments, uh, pr primarily in the chat, which you can get to at the bottom of the event. I see a couple of people have gone in there already. Uh, and I'll, go, I'll try and go through them as we're chairing the event as well. Um, if you want to ask a question with uh, in person, then feel free to raise your hand and I'll try and come to you when I can. And I hope that at, at the end, when we've gone through the, the pre-submitted questions, we'll, we'll try and have some time at the end to bring in uh, new questions then too. Um, I have a range of Oscar staff and some of our board here uh, listening to your questions and trying to give you answers, and I'll introduce them when, uh, when we get to, to their parts later. Uh, and lastly, please remember that we want to go through as many of your questions as we can. We want to be as open and informative as we can, but we won't be able to discuss individual charities or individual issues at, at this public event. So if you've got a question relating to uh, a specific charity or a specific incident or other things, I'd be delighted to, to sort that out, but not in this forum. So you can either put a, uh, leave us your details in the, in the chat and, and we'll get back to you and we'll set up a, a proper time to be able to discuss that properly. Martin Tyson, uh, our Head of Regulation Improvement, is going to give you some uh, background about Oscar and their work, and I'll bring George back in when he comes back in. Martin. Uh, yeah, what, what I'm just wanting to do is, is, is maybe do a little bit of scene setting. Obviously, the, you know, folks who are on the call will, are coming from a, a whole lot of different backgrounds, looking at the, the, the list of, of people that we have. And uh, just wanting to, to set the scene about, first of all, about the sector uh, and also about Oscar, just you know, for a bit of background to, to, to some of the discussion that we'll have later on. So I suppose that the, the, the most basic fact is we've got something over 25,000 charities on the register in Scotland. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that, that's come out of recent experience over the past couple of years is, is just underlining what, what amazing work that uh, charities in Scotland do, you know, benefits people in Scotland, benefits people uh, around the world. It's a very diverse sector that uh, we regulate. Um, it covers everything from you know, small community halls to religious organisations to sports clubs to health and social care organisations, campaigns to bring about change, universities, you know, a, a really diverse sector. And I think that the, the, the other thing that, that you know, is, is coming to the fore quite a lot is just what a significant part of Scotland's economy charities are. Uh, the annual income of, of charities in Scotland is, is around £14 billion, uh, and they have over 200,000 staff. I mean, just to put that in perspective, uh, that means that the, the Scottish charity sector is in a similar league as an employer to the NHS. I mean, that, that, that's quite hard to get your head around, but it, it, that, that, that's the, the, the case. Um, but the kicker with that is that in a very diverse sector, a lot of that sector is very small. Um, so around 68% of, of organisations on the register are run entirely by volunteers, and I think just over 50% 
have an annual income of less than twenty-five thousand pounds. So if you think of it like a pyramid, it's a very it's a pyramid with a very long, shallow base. Um, what you've got there running those charities are, are uh, you know, something around one hundred eighty thousand uh, charity trustees. Uh, they call that because the, the the assets of the charity are entrusted to them for the for the benefit of beneficiaries for their purposes, um, and they work together as a team, uh, you know, as, as a board, a committee, of management, whatever it is, and they have duties in law. Uh, the primary one being to act in the interests of the charity, and and that's I suppose one of the key places that we come in uh, to ensure that uh, charity trustees in Scotland are acting in line with their duties to take action where they're not, but also to support them, to, to help them to know what those duties are and, and, and you know, how to act uh, in, in, in line with those duties. Uh, all of those things are, are, are really important. One of the key things, the, you know, the foundation of our regulation is that we have uh, a charity register. You can't be a charity in Scotland uh, you can't call yourself a charity in Scotland uh, by and large unless you are registered. Every charity in Scotland has a, a unique charity number and there's an increasing degree of information that's available on the register about individual charities. Uh, having that charity number means that a charity meets the legal tests that are set out in the 2005 Act, our, our sort of founding legislation. They meet the, the, the charity test to, that, that uh, tests whether they're able to be called the charity in law. Every year, uh, all of those charities on the register are required to uh, report to OSCAR. They're, they're required to submit <clears throat> their annual accounts and their trustees' annual report to us. Um, they also give us an annual return, and that, that's what we use to, to populate the register. We also use it uh, as a basis for uh, the, 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 the survey and, and, and other work we do to inform people, including government funders uh, and, and the public, about charities in Scotland. Um, as I say, one of our functions uh, is to investigate misconduct by charity trustees or, or people running charities uh, where, that, where there's evidence that that's happening. Um, and where that's in the, the, the interests of, of the public to do so, uh, and, and where assets or and to take action where the, the assets of the charity or the beneficiaries are at risk. Um, more often, what the, the, the outcome of that will be is, is to make recommendations to the trustees to improve the running of a charity and, and to support them in doing that. Um, and at that point about support, you know, a, a good result for us is uh, one where we can support charity trustees to understand and comply with law and work with their stakeholders and, and get the maximum possible benefit for the public. And that's what we're working towards. Um, and that point about the public, that's what it comes back to. And that's what a lot of our work comes back to. It comes back to uh, the public being able to see and understand the work of charities how the money that they donate to charities gets spent. Uh, and that the, the, the upshot of that is what that we want the public to be able to trust charities and have confidence in them. Uh, what that means is that charities can continue to, to operate, can continue to, to, to benefit um, the, uh, the public and, and to fulfill their charitable purposes. That's the, that's the ultimate outcome for this. That's the, just, just a bit of background there and I'll, I'll hand back to, to John. Thank you very much, Martin. So uh, I see George has rejoined us. We'll give you a, a second bite at the cherry, George. If you can introduce yourself and give our audience just a, a brief overview of Oscar Nurbuck. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm George, George Walker. Uh, I became interim chair of Oscar in just April this year after, uh, sadly, uh, our previous chair had to step down due to ill health. Which was, which was a shame. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm delighted to get to work with a, a really professional group of people on the board and a fantastic uh, group of uh, leaders and staff right across Oscar. You can hear a little bit from some of our board members today because I'm, I'm really lucky. I'm joined by Stephanie, uh, by, by Jessica, 
Jess, we call her, uh, and by Jill, who actually, you might be interested to know, has just been appointed by the Cabinet Secretary as Deputy Chair to me uh, after um, Pat Armstrong um, stepping uh, down. And that's in part for continuity, because part Pat's term on the board of Oscar will come to an end next March. So as a responsible organisation, as you, you might expect, we're doing a little bit of future planning and future proofing. Um, I won't steal uh, any of, of uh, what Martin said, because Martin explained what Oscar did way better than I ever could. Suffice to say, I think that what we uh, on the board and what I know the whole staff team do is to work to ensure that we protect the charity sector, protect those who donate to charities and protect their interests. And of course, to ensure that that sector is stable. And so that what Oscar does have to take action, get involved with complaints, as Martin touched on, that we do that in a sensible and a balanced and a proportionate way. Um, and, and so that's the focus of what we're trying to do. I'm not going to say more today. I'm, uh, I just want to say welcome and thank you for coming. And um, I hope that you will have some questions for us later. And I'm sure we'll do our very best to answer them. So I'll pass back to John. And I know that he already has some advanced questions from me. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, George. So um, if everyone is sitting comfortably and you're all in the right, we, think we shall begin. The first question today, uh, a double header. What are the upcoming plans for the regulator? And is the problem with the Oscar password reset likely to be resolved soon? So um, to start off then, I'd like to introduce Maureen Mallon, the Chief Executive, to do the first part. And it's okay, Maureen, I'll do the IT stuff after. Ah, oh, spoil sport. Thanks, John. I was hoping to, to, to impress you all with my vast te 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 technology expertise, not. Um, so it is, I'd like to say a warm welcome at two, and, and it's just fantastic to see everybody. Um, we all really get so much from these events. Um, it's so important for us to touch base with a range of different people from the, from the charity sector and surrounding stakeholders. So thank you so much for being here. In terms of our, our upcoming plans, I mean, you would expect me to say, wouldn't you, that it's ultimately about the delivery of our corporate plan. And so we can put the, 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 the little links for that and our business plan up, up, up for you in due course. But essentially, as everyone said, we're trying to increasingly really focus on being an enabling regulator. That's about us being increasingly targeted about the work we, we're, 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 we're doing. So it's targeted improvement support. It's really honing our guidance to make sure that it, it really hits, it, it hits where it needs to hit. Um, and that we're using the data and knowledge and incredible intelligence we have to really help to shape and improve what government, both local and national and, and, and international and UK, frankly, are doing. So we try to get everybody to look and say, hello, if we're going to do anything about the charity sector, we'll go and talk to Oscar first because they probably know a lot of the answers to this. And so we're doing an awful lot of work um, that, that is starting to really pay off in those areas. And um, the last thing we want to have is to be sitting back, sitting smugly, feeling, I told you so, if something comes out and it's, 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 it's the wrong way around. So doing a lot of work on that area. And we are spending a lot of time this year um, working on the replacement for Oscar Online, um, what we, suppose we want to really emphasise, and John will, um, jo John will pick up on some of this too. But essentially what we want to do is assure you that we're trying to make sure that life is as simple as possible um, from that point of view. So actually most of you shouldn't notice much difference, but we should notice a lot of difference and it should make life easier and there should be more of you be able to engage in it. So um, fingers crossed, it's always exciting when you get to the end, this sort of almost the end of a, of a big piece of technology change. Um, but that's why John's looking quite, quite calm on the top and very swan-like, I think. Um, so in terms of that, the other final thing I suppose I wanted to say is we're also working really hard at speeding up our response times and finding all sorts of different ways to do that. Um, so trying to get smarter, I guess, like everybody else is. And of course, trying to make sure that all of us are as awfully as we are, as we can, can be with all of the technology to keep it as smooth as we can. So I suppose that's what I wanted to, 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 to highlight. Um, John, did you did you want me to hand back to you for technology, or have you also going, are we also going to ask George to come into this? No, I was going to. I'll, I'll I'll keep you waiting with bated breath about the password issue. George, do you, from a board perspective, what sort of uh, what are your upcoming plans and priorities over the next year or two? Okay, uh, fair question. Um, I suppose the most important thing to say is that, you know, like any board, ensuring that our governance is as solid and as robust as it can be 
that were um, looking right across Oscar to get all of the assurance that the board needs and uh, and requires. It, why? In order that Oscar can be the best regulator that it can be, in particularly just now in very difficult circumstances. And Maureen used that term, an enabling regulator, and gosh, was there ever a time when that might be um, more needed than now, when we're very cognizant of the fact that all of you, I'm very aware that we've got um, everyone from officers to staff to trustees of all sorts of charities uh, on, on with us today. And we know how hard that you're working uh, during uh, the pandemic and the challenges of that. And really our role, therefore, I think is to support you where we can, be enabling where we can, ensure that Oscar is in rude health and is in a position to be the best regulator it can be, to both protect the interests of those who put money into the charitable sector, as I said earlier, and to make sure that that sector is stable by appropriate and sensible and proportionate intervention where that's needed. So I think those are the plans. And actually, I would just highlight what Maureen said, because um, I would echo it from the board's point of view. A lot of work has been going on internally to get Oscar in the best shape it can be in to regulate effectively and um, to clear some of the backlog and some of the challenges that we've had. I, I make no bones about it. We have had some challenges during uh, the pandemic with everybody working at home. Some things are really uh, effective and really efficient and some things are just a wee bit harder and take a wee bit more time. And that means that um, uh, maybe sometimes our response rates and so on could be better. We know that. And there's a huge amount of work going on behind the scenes, as Maureen referenced, to sharpen how we do that, to look at how we communicate, to respond uh, as best and as quickly as we can to the sector, all while, as a board, ensuring that we get the assurance we need that Oscar's appropriately um, governed. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, George. And on, I think we'll come to the, the question of responses and contacting Oscar just in a second. But before we do that, just to answer the question directly, we know that there's a, a problem with uh, resetting a password for access to our online systems now for some users. Um, and what we're doing to address that is actually, uh, well, the answer to that from our, our perspective is, is to implement a new system. So rather than fixing the old system, which is creaky and under a bit of pressure, um, is that we are in the final stages of testing the, the, the replacement to Oscar Online. Actually, for most charities or uh, intermediaries who use the system, we hope that it won't be a, a huge change. We're going to ask the same questions, uh, we're going to log into the same places and other things, but it'll look a lot easier and it'll help us at the back end of it collect that information more effectively and efficiently. So when we implement a replacement system, which uh, we currently hope will, will be uh, in weeks rather than months, um, we will, he said, try not to name a date on a call with 100 people on it, um, but imminently, uh, then that issue should be resolved for, for most of our users then. So we're sorry it's taken so long, but th that's why but we're, we're, it's part of a wider digital improvement plan. And George talked just a second ago, about response times and that sort of thing. And this actually ties into our second question, which was currently, what's the best way to make contact with staff at Oscar? Uh, Maureen. Well, hopefully through events like this, and this actually brings us all together as, as human beings, which is lovely. And um, we do tend to be out and about a fair amount and attending lots of different events for other organisations as well. We try to be smart about doing a lot of that and, 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 and being engaged around and about. Obviously, we can't. We, we we're a lot less likely to meet each other physically these days. But um, you know, we all we'll, we we we'll all work on that as we go. Um, at the moment, we would say that um, the the easiest way by far to contact Oscar is by using our contact form. I know it can be the instinct could be that oh you know just pick up a phone, but actually, um, given the way that we're all working, um, it's very often that um, that that even well before you would get to the form, the information will be there on. The website. Now we know it can be tricky to find things because there's an awful lot of information there and um, so um, please use the search functions on that and um, if not do the old-fashioned thing of googling your way into to, to all, all of that too. 
you will find almost anything that you want to know from us about Oscar and, and our activities online and on, and, and, and on our website. And um, so please have a look around in that first rather than thinking, oh, it's easier just to pick up a phone because getting through the, the, the phone systems just now and with everybody working virtually, um, it, just, it just means that there's a time lag. And to be honest, we, we will also find it trickier to get you to the right person directly because if you think that we're an organisation of about 50 people and most of whom have got a, a lot of specialist knowledge, so trying to get to the right people through that loop is not as easy as just looking down in the old fashioned way we used to be able to do. I'm in the office today, so I can normally look and say, yep, no problem, I'll put you through to John, he's sitting right there. But just now these things take take a little bit more of a turn in time. So um, please do have a look at the, and, and use the contact form. We've also got, um, if we do say so ourselves, pretty up to date and pretty good versions of all the frequently asked questions out there and, and, and about. So make good use of them and what's there. Probably the question you, 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 you want to ask us, even if it does feel unique, will have been asked before, and please don't take that badly, and think about that as, phew, that's good, I'm not, going, I'm, I'm not going off my head here with this question, somebody else has also faced this issue before, so have a look around, have a look at the FAQs, um, and we, we will, if you get in touch with us through the, through the contact form, get back to you as soon as we can, and um, we, we, we would tell you it's, it, it'll, take, it, it'll take us no, no longer than 15 days, but um, please don't think it will take us 15 days that's it that, that's 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 us doing a classic thing of an organization of telling you the longest it'll be and um, but we tend to get back on off lot faster than that thank you Maudie um that so if you want to get a hold of us the contact form is absolutely the best way the as part of our work as a regulator um we try to be enabling and encouraging to charities but on some occasions we do need to investigate to uh, or look into the work of charities and the trustees. One of the questions that we had uh, at the sign up was, how many investigations is Oscar conducting in my in the area of my third sector interface? So in my local area. Martin, could you set out an answer to that question? Because I'm not sure we gather statistics on that basis. We don't. I mean, j j just to be uh, clear to everyone, uh, you know, not everyone in the call may, may, may know this, third sector interface are the, the, the organisations that are in every local authority area that are uh, set up, among a whole bunch of other jobs, to uh, advise and, and support uh, the, the voluntary sector in, in, in their area. Um, so you're roughly talking about local authority areas yet there. We don't publish uh, geographical stats on investigations because the numbers are, are likely to be quite small and, and, and might identify individual investigations. Pulling back and talking about the numbers overall, we uh, got, we, we received 426 concerns uh, from the public and, and other people about uh, charities last year. That was probably a little bit lower than usual because of the, the pandemic. Um, out of that, we took forward uh, 43 uh, sort of full-blown inquiries. Um, where we, we, we you know, fully used our, our investigative powers. So the numbers there in, in any given local area are going to be quite low. Um, just talking a little bit about those two numbers. So that's a, a, you know, a fair amount coming in and, and a much smaller number that we take forward. Um, what the law tells us we have to do is to be proportionate and targeted in the way that we work. So uh, that means you know, we're expected to make a judgment about what cases we, we, we take on. And we do that on the basis of a, of a risk assessment that looks at uh, whether or not the issues that people have raised with us uh, speak to things that are in our risk framework, uh, the credibility of the evidence that we've got, and the level of threat to the charity or its activities or its assets or, or the people that benefit from it. So what that means is that, that there's a, a lot of, of concerns that we get that aren't uh, appropriate for us to, to take forward as inquiries. Uh, in a lot of cases, what we'll do is go back to the charity and, and provide support and maybe recommendations, possibly signpost them to uh, you know, a TSI or, or another support you know, source of help uh, to, to you know, address if there are any issues. Sometimes it'll be a, uh, th there'll be something that's not a matter that we can take forward, but that another organisation can and we'll, we'll, we'll send the, the concern a uh, the, the person who's raised, raised the concern to them. Uh, sometimes it'll be one that uh, 
it's not for us. It, it, it's not uh, we, we, you know, a, a, a risk that we will feel we need to look at, but it's one that the charity trustees need to deal with. And we'll, we'll say to the, the concerner, go back to the charity trustees and you know, uh, ask them to deal with it. And the interest for us might be if they don't deal with it, uh, you know, satisfactorily. Um, if you're talking about you, know, what will we be doing with charities in in your local area? So some of it, the, 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 there'll be a, a certain degree of, of uh, investigatory activity. What we'll be dealing with a lot more is the stuff that John and and, and Maureen have just been talking about, uh, which is you know queries and and, and uh, you know ask your requests for support or, or other sort of interactions with with charities. That'll be you know advice on, on what they should do about a particular change they want to make. Uh, you know, what advice on uh, accounts um, will be having a, a, a lot of that level of, of interaction as well. So the the uh, the inquiry, you know, the full blown inquiry uh, numbers are likely to be quite low in a particular area. Uh, the rest of the activity will probably be a bit, a bit larger. I uh, hope that helps. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'm trying to see if I've got, I don't have any, I don't see anything else in the chat about investigation in particular but if anyone's got any more general questions about it feel free to put them in the chat or we'll come back to you at the end next question um are uh, what are the benefits from becoming a charity and what are the requirements for example what paperwork needs to be submitted regularly and when um, i'm going to go to a member of board jess wade are you there jess Thanks very much, John. Oh, that's Hi, everybody. Okay. Uh, I'm Jess Wade, uh, and as John says, uh, I'm a member of the board, uh, and I've been in and around Scottish charities for around 20 years, uh, first as a volunteer, and now as a staff member and a trustee of uh, a number of organisations. So I hope uh, that I'm well placed to answer this one. Um, so obviously, as Martin outlined um, at the start, as the regulator, we are the gatekeepers of charitable status in Scotland, and we keep a register of all the charities in Scotland. And there are some benefits to becoming a charity. So for example, uh, tax or rates relief, greater access to funding. So, you know, you may have noticed uh, funds that you that you can't apply to if you're not a charity, for example, um, and so, uh, or asset transfer and some uh, VAT concessions as well. Um, and obviously lots of charities are, are quite rightly proud, very proud of their charitable status and do as much as they can to promote it as possible. So for example, by using their unique uh, Oscar logo on their own website as well, uh, just to promote that. Um, but there's obviously also a lot of responsibility that comes with running a charity, um, both individually and as a group. Uh, so charity trustees are, again, as Martin uh, mentioned earlier, subject to general duties in law. So um, specifically, they must act in the interests of the charity. Um, and they're expected to understand these duties and what they mean in practice. So what that looks like for running a charity. And there's five specific duties as well, which relate to things like fundraising, um, making sure the right details are on the charity register um, and included in that, uh, in reference to the part of the question about uh, requirements and paperwork, um, is the annual requirement to submit the annual uh, report and accounts and key information for the annual return, um, which populates the information on the charity register entry. Um, and we have quite a lot of good information on our website about all of that and about trustees responsibilities and duties um, and guidance around good governance as well. Um, and I was quite pleased to hear uh, John talking about the, um, you know, the, the website updates, because I remember when I first came on the board, uh, one of the things I was talking about was when if people may remember if you've been doing this a while, when you couldn't submit your um, accounts online if they were over a certain, uh, a certain size and you, then you had to print it off and post it in and all of that. So um, there's been a lot of change and more to come to make it easier, hopefully, for people to meet, um, meet uh, their responsibilities and duties as trustees. Um, there's also some really good information available on the SCVO website that can help you think about um, if setting up a new organisation is right for you. Um, and of course, there's lots of information and support if you do decide to go down that route. And equally, rather than setting up a new charity, it could be worth searching the register to see if there's already an organisation out there that is making the difference that you want to make um, and to see whether you could um, be a part of that and find out how you could get involved. Uh, we often hear charities 
uh, saying that they're looking for good charity trustees. And I know myself, certainly um, through a number of trustee roles and in my own working life, um, just how valuable uh, a team of great, passionate, knowledgeable, committed trustees are. You know, they are worth so much and make such a difference, um, you know, as we said at the start, uh, to, the, to the sector in Scotland. Um, so, you know, uh, great trustees are so hugely valuable. So um, if, you, if you're interested in getting involved with existing work, you know, I'm sure it would be much appreciated too. Thanks very much, Jess. I mean, I think for you know, my experience in working with Oscar and, and the third centre organisation previously, is there is a lot of information out there for uh, charities or community groups or third centre groups about what form you should take. Um, but I would definitely recommend you know, speak to your interface, speak to you, have a look at SCBO and look through our website as well. It's got a lot of different information there and for you to be able to make the right decisions about, uh, about what's best for you and your organisation. So moving on and trying to get through as many questions as we can by three. We've got a couple of uh, shorter, maybe more, te more technical stuff, Martin, specific stuff. So the first one is, when is SCIO status, a SCIO, the Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation, that's a, a particular type of charity, when is SCIO status recognised throughout the UK and abroad? Yeah. I think it's got pretty good recognition now, and I, I was desperately googling there for, for when the SCIO actually came in. I think we're we're talking about uh, either nine or, or, or ten years ago now, if if, if not longer. So I think there's uh, there's good recognition certainly in the UK. I think what's helped there is uh, the, uh, the the, the SCIOs are, are also on the register of uh, you know they're, they're noted on the register of companies now uh, because they're, they're they're incorporated and they have that that legal entity status on, on their own. Um, we do uh, a leaflet called Working with SCIOs that's specifically for, you know, for, the, for, for, for charities or, or, or other people working with charities to give to, to organisations, banks being, being one of them, uh, that work with charities uh, and, and work with SCIOs to, to try and increase that recognition. Uh, in terms of abroad, I'm not aware of a, of a, of a uh, specific issue with SCIOs more than for any other Scottish charity. We will occasionally get uh, you know, a charity saying, look, uh, we're having to deal with a, a, an overseas you know, administration and they need a, a letter or you know, some recognition uh, that the thing's a charity. Not, it's, it's that rather than being a SCIO. Uh, but uh, you know, it'd be interesting if, if there is any, uh, uh, you know, any other experience that people have. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, I've got another follow up, I suppose, a different question on types of, of charities and changing that. So the question was, how simple is it to transfer status, association to an incorporated charity? Uh, okay, so the, the, uh, the short answer is it depends. Uh, the long answer <laughs> also is uh, it depends. Um, and Thanks very much. <laughs> what it depends on most of all is is what your charity is like and what it does and what kind of assets it has. I think probably the key one there being what what kind of assets it has. If uh, it is an incorporated charity, the, 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 an unincorporated charity that, that's wanting to incorporate has nothing in the way of paid staff, has nothing in the way of, of, of assets or, or you know other kind of contractual uh, entanglements, then that process can be relatively quick. Certainly from, from, our, from the point of view of interacting with us and the decisions we have to make, it doesn't have to be a, 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 a long process. When it takes the time is where an unincorporated charity has uh, particularly uh, heritable property, you know, houses, land, uh, buildings to transfer to the new incorporated body. That's what takes the time. And that's to do with the legalities of, of transferring that property. There's no quick way of doing that. Uh, similarly, there can be issues around uh, staff contracts. Um, I think I've noticed, uh, you know, Stephanie there's also mentioned that the, 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 the banks, banks can be an issue. Uh, other regulators, uh, you know, for instance, the, the, the care inspector, the, 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 there are some, some uh, things to, for, for charities to be aware of around uh, transferring registrations with, with some other um, you know, some other regulators when you incorporate. So, sorry, that, that, that's a, a, a very sort of diffuse answer, but it, it, it's, it's a diffuse problem. And it does, it, it's very much, before you start, look at what your charity's like. What are the, the you know, never mind that the paperwork with us, that's the simple bit, what tends to be, what else have you got to do to get from here to there? Okay. Thanks very much, Martin. And 
Uh, I know that I think we may have to have a separate webinar so we can all get together and complain about banks and uh, how they how they deal with their own uh, organisations and others. Um, but uh, we do regularly meet actually with a, a group of uh, banking institutions to discuss with them some of the, the issues that you've raised with us. The I see in the chat uh, both uh, Paula and Ian Grieve from Oscar are putting in, as people are talking, links to documents or parts of our website that are being referred to in the answers. So I know that you, know, you might not want to sit and look at that at the same time as being in the chat, but that all that information will be there down the side at the end of the call if you want to go through all that. Now, I know that um, fundraising uh, is a huge and essential part of the work that our charities does, but the, the, Oscar's relationship with fundraising activities is sometimes uh, not be entirely clear. So one of the questions that we have today is who regulate, if Oscar regulates charities, who regulates fundraising? And, and we'll decide that Stephanie Fraser from our board is going to take forward that answer. Are you there, Stephanie? I am. I hope you can all hear me and I hope I don't sound like Doctor Who. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, John, for passing this question to me. Um, does Who regulates fundraising? Well, the main thing is that um, it's important to remember that it's not only charities that fundraise. Um, fundraising can be carried out by individuals or groups or, or a great number of different um, organizations. And OSCAR is about regulating charities. Um, so fundraising is therefore covered by a number of laws or regulations. Um, however, what I would say is that um, the, the Charities Act makes it very explicit that charity trustees have a specific duty under that law concerning um, the financial governance of a charity or an organization and specifically concerning fundraising. Um, and a, a duty, a more general duty, to comply with any other laws or regulations. Um, so Oscar does expect charity trustees to be clear and confident and know about their charity's fundraising activities, all of their act. You know, we want trustees to know about all of the charity's activities because trustees are in a position of control, and that includes fundraising. So how is your organisation going about fundraising? Do you have or do you need, for example, a gift acceptance policy? And this is all part of trustees' duties and good governance. Um, I suppose it is a, it's a difficult one because it's a very public-facing um, aspect of, of what charities do, and therefore it does attract possibly the most potential for criticism. So it's really, really important that trustees are on top of it. Now, we're very lucky, John, we do have someone here from the um, fundraising panel, do we not? Yes, so what Dion, I will be... is that right? Are you, are you in the call, Dion? I am, I'm here. Hi, Leo. Ah, there you are, Dion. Sorry, there's so many people on this call. I hadn't, I hadn't spotted you, but can I hand over to you? Because actually, what we have in Scotland is the wonderful independent Scottish fundraising standards panels so if you could if i can hand over to you that would be great sure. Sure. so Dan, if, if there is a so if there's a complaint about fundraising where should where should it be sent and who should deal with that okay so um the the scottish fundraising standards panel or we're soon to become the scottish fundraising adjudication panel uh, we oversee the system of enhanced self-regulation of fundraising in scotland we're responsible for fundraising standards and adjudicate on fundraising complaints related to scottish charities um, so we operate a three-stage complaints process where we ask that people complaining they go to the charity directly first. Um, if that doesn't resolve the complaint, they then should appeal to the trustees. Um, as everyone has said, like the trustees have a, a duty to make sure the charities run well, and that includes overseeing their fundraising practices. Um, at that point, if the complainant is still dissatisfied with the response that they've had from the charity and the trustees that's when the uh, independent panel can examine whether or not there has been a breach of the code of fundraising practice and the code of fundraising practice you'll all be aware is housed by the fundraising regulator so the panel we adjudicate on complaints about 
charities that are um, registered with OSCAR and the fundraising regulator um, looks after charities that are registered with the Charity Commission in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. And where there is crossover, we run a, a lead regulator model. So depending on where it's headquartered, we'll uh, dictate who um, looks after that complaint. Um, we also have a good fundraising guarantee, which is similar to the fundraising regulators regulators fundraising promise where charities um, can apply to become part of that scheme and it makes a positive statement about their their values cultures and practices and it outlines how the public can expect to be treated by your fundraisers um, by registering you demonstrate your commitment to adhering to fundraising best practice as in outlined in the code of practice and ensuring all their fundraising remains legal open honest and respectful. Um, that is a very whistle-stop tour of what we do. Um, I know that Paul has put a link up for our website and if anyone ever wants to get in touch with us, there's uh, contact details on the website and you'll find us on Twitter as well. Thanks, Dion. That's really helpful. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and just helping to clarify the, the relationship between uh, charitable interest and fundraising interest too. So, Thank you very much. The okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've got 17 minutes left and we have five more questions that have been submitted to me that I want to go through. We've also, I know that there's a, a great deal going on in the chat as well. Um, and so some of our questions are going to be answered there. And if we've got time at the end, I'll try and go through uh, the questions that have been raised in the chat too. So thank you very much, Dion. The Our next question then, um, we're going to put to Jill, uh, uh, the Deputy Chair. Jill, the question is, should trustees have basic training? Well, thank you, John, and hello, everybody. My name's Jill Vickerman, and I've recently, as, as George said, been um, become the Deputy Chair of Oscar after having spent over three years on the board. Um, so uh, in the spirit of keeping this really short, John, because you've just given me a reminder of how little time there is, then absolutely, yes, uh, we, we would very much expect there to be some basic training for all trustees. We, we would expect that to be, to be part of an induction process when anybody takes on a new role as a trustee within a charity and, and expect that the charity to enable that new trustee to get a good understanding of the charity itself, but also to, to find out a lot about the details of the responsibilities that you take on when becoming a trustee, because there is, there's a lot involved in, in the role. There's really a lot of responsibilities around helping the, the charity form its strategy around, we've talked about fundraising, there's decision-making, ensuring that the, comply, that the charity complies with law around volunteering, etc. So, but, but there is some help with this. So I, I noticed there was a bit of a chat in the sidebar earlier, and I think Paula provided a link to find your local third sector interface where you can get training. But also there is there is guidance on the Oscar website, and I'm sure Paula will pop a link to that now. So, I, as I say, in the spirit of being short, I will stop there. Thank you, John. That's okay. Thank you very much, Jill. The if I can bring Maureen in actually as well, I know there was a similar question about. I know we're running we're so we're running an event today because we're trying to be open and transparent and talk to as wide an audience as we can about the sort of work that Oscar's engaged in. But how can, so Maureen, how could Oscar support charity trustees to stay abreast of latest developments in governments and other issues? Okay, I'm going to keep this really, really short. Um, I'm going to suggest you have a good look at our website. As I previously suggested, we've got a lot of good guidance and blogs. We do a lot, a lot on social media and we're not the only ones that do that. So again, I think we would encourage you to follow other organisations, other like-minded ones and national organisations to find out about that. Come to events like this, but also sign up to our newsletter. Um, our, our newsletter comes out regularly and actually provides lots of good links to, 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 to enable people to think about all sorts of different areas. So if you haven't already signed up to the newsletter, um, please do that. And I'm sure poor, poor Paula's, oh, in fact, she's so speedy, isn't she? I was thinking she's, she's probably looking after that already. So there you are. Thank you very much. Uh, what I would say is I think you know, in 20 years working in communications, I don't, I don't think I'd seen a better read newsletter 
than the one that Ian Greaves does for us. So I know Ian's in the call, so it's, it's his piece of work. But there's a, I would definitely recommend to go into that because every six weeks you get some information from Oscar and we bring, we give partners a, a, a platform there to, to talk about their work as well. And I think that's probably, if you're going to start somewhere, I would start with signing up to the newsletter and the link just now. So keeping on the theme of uh, supporting uh, trustees, this question I think I actually saw earlier in the chat as well, I'd like to put to Stephanie Fraser. So Stephanie, the question was, uh, can Oscar play a part in encouraging trustees wishing to stand out to A, give a minimum of six months notice and B, make an effort to find replacements? Thank you, John. Um, the short answer to this question is no, because um, the important thing is that each organisation does the right thing in terms of governance for their own organisation. So I would encourage um, trustees to look, for example, at the um, Code of Good Governance, the Scottish Governance Code, which I'm sure Paul is about to, to share. Um, and I think the other thing is that, you know, we can encourage um, trustees to look at uh, succession planning. It's really important it, that succession planning is the responsibility of the whole organisation um, and not any one individual about when they will or will not be able to um, give notice. Um, as George mentioned at the beginning of this call, there are occasions, and we've had it at Oscar with our chair, where for reasons beyond anybody's control, an organisation has to make a very quick change. So thinking about key man risk and succession planning is something that we would encourage organizations to do, but it's not something we can regulate. Um, the other thing that we can signpost is, is thinking about timings. You know, if, if boards have to ratify any appointments at an AGM, um, you know, we, we do encourage and we, we ask, for example, in the Oscar return, um, when did you last look at your organization's constitution? You know, what does your constitution say? Is it right for you? Um, you know, and I know that there um, are many, um, there are many things on the Oscar website to help you if you need to make changes to things like your constitution. But all we can say is, um, in terms of succession planning, it's very important everybody thinks about it, and it's very important it's right for your organ organization. Thanks very much, Stephanie. I saw. I think David Ashford at the start of the, the conversation reiterated that question too. So I hope David will um, at least thinks, I, I, I'm not sure that was the answer you were hoping for, but hopefully it will have explained the position prop, properly to you. But if you've got specific things, maybe we can come back to that a bit later on. Um, so a couple more questions to go. I'm going to go back to Maureen and Martin. Um, a question about the role of third sector interfaces, TSIs. So regarding, TS, regarding TSIs, how can they be completely independent in dealing with local complaints against members? So obviously as a regulator, we'll receive uh, complaints or information from people and we, and we will look into that. But how can, what, what's the role of TSIs in that and how can they be independent? And the, the, the role of TSIs is to uh, provide support, provide advice, provide guidance. Uh, I think that the, 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 the terms of their uh, funding from, uh, you know, that the, the, the they get from, from various uh, sources will, will, you know, set out how, how they should do that. Uh, it can be really difficult in local areas where, uh, you know, complaints within local communities can be, can be very tricky. Uh, and, and there can be different uh, interests involved. We understand that, but the the, the role there is is not to take sides. Uh, the role is, is uh, you know where possible to to offer advice, uh, to to offer guidance, um, to you know, refer where, you know, where there's a, a really intractable issue. Sometimes it can be about referring to to, to mediation uh, or, or you know, help secure some mediation from a, a third party. But uh, I think that the, the, you know, there are limits on what uh, a third sector interface or, or any uh, outside body can do where uh, conflicts within the charity or, or conflicts with, between a charity and another organisation are really deep-seated and intractable. 
and you know in some cases that will be a, a, a matter for us where there, there's evidence that the, the charity trustees aren't uh, acting as they should. Thanks Martin, pretty specific. Have you anything to add Maureen? Really just to say that um, we've got the greatest of respect for, and, uh, for, for the amount of sheer professionalism that comes through from TSIs and from uh, other intermediary bodies too. I think very often people will worry about the amount of independence that's there um, and, and, I, and, and I would say that's not a worry I would share. I think, uh, I think people know how to be impartial and how to actually put, 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 um, put, put relationships aside even though it can be really tricky and I think we can, we can all recognise that every now and again. I'm sure that things will slip up but I think we've got a lot of faith and confidence in, in, in that area with those partners. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and so the last of our questions that were uh, from the ones who were submitted in advance is um, a question on registered social landlords. So I'm going to ask Martin from a staff perspective and then George Walker to come in on this. Question is, what representation, if any, has Oscar made to the Scottish Government about the growing number of registered social landlords building for the private rental sector using the resources and finances meant for the social tenants? And it says an, an impossible breach of their objects. Martin, have we made any representations? Okay, so the short answer to that is, is no. Uh, that, that's not something that we uh, have uh, looked at or, or uh, considered recently. Um, there have been occasions in the past where we've had uh, discussions with uh, with the Scottish Housing Regulator and you know, Community Scotland before that, and with Scottish ministers, where there were various initiatives about um, you know sort of mixed market renting, um, mid market rents, or uh, the old uh, rent to buy scheme. And what our uh, part in that was is to set out where. You know, the circumstances where those schemes could be uh, in furtherance of a, of a charitable uh, social landlord's purposes. Th those purposes t tend to be very uh, set, you know, th th they're a very common set of purposes, and they're, they're usually about uh, providing you know, relief to people who are in housing need. So the, uh, all of those activities need to be uh, in furtherance of that purpose. Um, the other Thing we need to look at and it comes back to the, the, the legal test the charity test is uh, where there's private benefit to individuals whether it's tenants who are, are, are becoming uh, you know house owners th th themselves um, then um, you know you know, we need to assess that against the the, the overall public benefit that the landlord uh, provides so that's the, the, the you know that's the general principle you know, that's how we've looked at it in the past. It's not something we've looked at, uh, you know, recently. Thanks, Martin. George, have you anything to add? Not very much. I suppose I would just point out that the, the area is a tricky one in law. Um, and the reason it's a tricky one in law is because, of course, Oscar and the Scottish Housing Regulator, which is somebody in this column that I, I chair, um, uh, regulates the registered social landlord uh, as a charity in Oscar's case or as a, an RSL in, in the uh, SHR's case, but they do not regulate, they have no authority over subsidiaries. And that's an anomaly, if you like, in law. And so there's no reach into subsidiaries. And so as Martin's explained, that when organisations do what's discussed, I won't repeat the question, um, there's actually nothing in law to stop them doing that. There are some, there are quite strict guidelines around housing and I think in charities around uh, the approach to it and sticking to those guidelines, but there is nothing in law which prevents a charity or a registered social landlord, and they might be both, uh, or they, they might only be one of those, not all RSLs are charities. Um, there's nothing that stops them having a, a, a subsidiary which uh, builds, house for, builds houses for private rent. Of course, what happens is, is typically the aim would be that any profit from that is recycled because it's recycled back into the charity and the question was asked about charities. So uh, in terms of that, both Oscar and indeed I contend SHR have, have a limited ability there. Um, uh, and it's not something that's been a huge discussion of late with the Scottish government, I suppose, because I want to, you know, that's the question that was asked. Uh, and Martin's made that comment from the Oscar point of view. So some challenges around law about the organisation we regulate, 
whether we as Oscar or whether we as this, the Scottish Housing Regulator, because regulators have to be quite careful to operate within the law and the legislation as laid down by the Scottish Parliament. Um, even though sometimes that could frustrate folk, and we understand that, but the law is the law and we have to operate within that. Okay, thank you uh, very much, George, for, for that. And Luke Morrison, I have two and a half minutes to the hard stop at three o'clock that I promised everybody at the start. Um, so I'm going to quickly look through the text. And that, um, Helen Gregg had a question, uh, are charities entitled to having packs refunded from things they purchase? Is this something an accountant who deals with an Oscar return should also be handling? Uh, Martin, do you have... Could you hear yeah. in 60 um, seconds or less? Okay, so the short answer is uh, sometimes uh, charities can get some uh, relief from that. Uh, that uh, is definitely something you should ask your accountant about. Uh, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, I'm, I'm not qualified to do that. And, and I'm not, if I'm very honest, fully sure I understand the, the, the VAT rules on that. Here we go. I made, it, I made it 58 minutes before forgetting to unmute myself. I can't remember. I was the first person to do so. But that's, okay, that's two minutes to three. And so I think what we're going to do, oh, thank you very much, Christine. There's some background in charity tax there. Uh, I, I'm going to bring us to an end. I know I've tried to go through as many of the questions as we could that were submitted to us in advance. If you have any Hopefully, we'll go through them all. If you've got any other questions, then you can feel free to email us at info at oscar.org.uk or email me, john.fellows at oscar.org.uk, and I'll happily make sure that the right member of staff or board member gets to see the questions that you raise. And I'll pop that out to thank Paula and Ian in the background and Martin and for going through the chat and posting links and everyone else who's helped with that information there too. And I know that Paula is going to send a questionnaire or an evaluation form through an email in the next five minutes. So if you could let us know what you thought of the call, then that would be, I would be grateful to hear what you've got to say so we can make these things better uh, going forward in the future. So, John, oh, John, yes. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt. I'm just going to ask you just for your forbearance because I did notice, I don't think you spotted it, but um, Ms. Grace Elder there had a oh. hand up very long and, time. Oh, I'm really sorry. Of, of all think. people. Um, and uh, uh, I don't want to be disrespectful. Now, it may oh, happen that I can only see the folk on my screen. But because of that, um, and I do think we still have a minute or so, but oh, um, I wonder if we could just take that question. Sorry to, to cut through oh, you there. that's okay. I just was oh. very aware of the long time she had her hand up. Sorry, my quick scrolling through the four screens of people in front of me, uh, Dorothy Grace Eller, I, I missed you. Fire away. What can we do to help? Your Hold courtesy, on a minute, George Walker, thank you for your courtesy. Now, I was going to ask, uh, obviously, you report to the Scottish Parliament, and, and that is right, but your officials are appointed by the Scottish Government. So how do you represent yourselves as truly independent? Because the Scottish Government is related to some charities, is involved with some charities. So how are you functioning as really independent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I think that's a, a, a fundamental and straightforward issue. George, do you want to start with that and I'll maybe come to Maureen in a second to uh, yeah. on the back of any answer I'm, you have? I'm quite happy to make a start and I'm going to ask Maureen to comment as well. Uh, in the, um, the first thing that I would say is that our officials are not appointed by the Scottish Government. Uh, our officials are appointed within Oscar. Now, um, it happens that within a number of the non-ministerial offices in Oscars 1, that those officials and staff members are members of the civil service. But I'll let Maureen maybe comment on, on that process. Is Oscar able to be, now I've only been here for five minutes, so I don't want to, to overstate my knowledge, uh, Dorothy. Um, is Oscar able to be independent? Um, I believe it is in a number of ways. First of all, it operates independent of ministers and having chair another uh, non-ministerial office and interim chair here, I can say I felt no pressure from ministers to behave in particular ways and I've received respect from them. When Oscar takes sometimes quite a strongly different position than the Scottish Government might take, 
or indeed other regulators have too. So I don't see that there is a huge issue with Oscar, and I can only speak in, in my own experience uh, in being able to operate uh, independently. Um, because I, I can certainly speak for the, a number of my board members are here today, and these are not shy retiring people. They're pretty effective, uh, pretty experienced board members, and they speak up and speak their own minds and are there to represent Oscar. So in that sense, I think at a board level, uh, Oscar is able to operate independently and indeed is able to speak up to and again sometimes when they take a different view than ministers uh, or officials within the Scottish Government might uh, might take. Maureen, I don't know if you'd a comment about appointment processes, but certainly, uh, unless I'm wrong, uh, I think I'm pretty clear in my own mind that no one is appointed to Oscar uh, beyond the board, who is appointed by ministers, I admit, Dorothy, you're right, uh, but, but individual uh, officials within Oscar, uh, in my understanding, I'm not appointed by the Scottish Government. Thanks, George, and th 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 thank you for for the for the question. Um, yes, so uh, all the all, all of the officials within uh, who work um, with within Oscar are are civil servants, Scottish government civil servants. The, the the protection that we have in order to be able to operate as fully independent as uh, independently as we do is actually through the framework agreement I think predominantly that we have with Scottish government and um, that was the most recent one was uh, was published just over two years ago and um, so just just a few months into and in, 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 into in, into my appointment we we um, negotiated with Scottish government in terms of that framework agreement I think that's very robust in setting out not just it's it's not one of these sort of easy factual things that just says this is what Oscar will do it's actually very clear in saying this is what the responsibilities of Scottish government are, are and this is what the, the the responsibilities of Oscar are um, I don't, um, as the most senior um, per person in the organisation in terms of in terms of being part of the senior civil service, um, I don't. Um, I'm not line managed by civil service. I'm actually line managed by the chair. Um, and we, as a non-ministerial office, I think have that really helpful firewall. Um, I find it helpful because very often, as George pointed out, and I don't want to go into specific examples here, but it would it would um, it's not remotely unusual for me to ha have to get in touch with with ministers with officials to say Oscar are not happy with X, Y and Z and Oscar fully expect X, Y and Z to be changed or happen or so on and here's A, B and C suggestion about how you could do your jobs more effectively, um, love Maureen or love any of the rest of us from here. So I think we are very clear that um, it, it is our role to, to carry that role out independently um, and yes of course we do also benefit as being, as, 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 as being civil servants um, as, as individuals. I hope that answers the question. Sorry, Dorothy, I can't hear you properly. I will un try and unmute you from here. Yes, there you go. yes. Th thank you, Maureen. And uh, thank you, George. And I really do hope that happens. And I did mean the board, the high hegens, not uh, necessarily every single person. But we'll look to the future and see what is happening because that distance is absolutely essential for public trust, as you know. Very much. Yes, and I, you know, I would completely agree with you. I think that that distance really does matter. And that's why um, I think, I don't know if my board comments would have a different view, but my board colleagues rather would have a different view, but we um, are not on the receiving end of micromanagement that, I, that in my experience, some officials or, or ministers, you're right to point that, and that's why I made that point a little later. Uh, I realised that was perhaps that you were saying that, that each of the board members are appointed by, by, by ministers. That, that's just how it works and we can change that. Um, but once that appointment is made, ah, you know. we, are, we are left off the parliament. We are left to operate um, as the professionals and with hopefully the skill set and, and, and knowledge we're given. So I hope that helps to give some assurance. That's not to say that any of these things are ever easy, by the way. They can they can come with our, with our challenges, um, but um, that's certainly how we, we do our very best to operate. Thank you. I, thank you, um, Dorothy Grace, for the question and for George and Maureen for the answer. I think that's hopefully a, a good way to finish. I know we had a couple of quick technical questions in there, but there's a be able to establish, re reaffirm our independent streak is probably a good way to finish. So I've had a 
quick double check, and I can't see any other hands up, so we are going to finish now. When we have an opportunity, I'll repost the video on the website, and so you can watch again, um, if you can uh, handle that excitement, uh, and, and encourage your friends and colleagues to do so too. I'd like to thank all the contributors uh, for asking questions, for coming along today and writing in the chat, and for the staff and the Board of Oscar for taking time to answer these questions too. Like so you can email me directly, john.fellows at oscar.org.uk if, you, if you have any specific things coming from this that you want to, to feed back, and look out for the email from Paula with the evaluation form that you should have any minute now so we can make these sessions better in the future. Thank you again and have uh, a great end to the day. Goodbye.